It's another beautiful, snowy Saturday morning. Today I'm at my house. Can't work in town because, well, there's nothing to do there. What I need to do is be right here in the shop making these window trims. Let's look at the plan here. My notes from the house. All I did was take a few simple numbers from the uh, extension jams of the windows here, and I'm gonna oversize these by a quarter in every direction that I want to reveal. So that's it. We're gonna start by breaking down a lot of the material just into the rough lengths, over length. Uh, this is the wood we're gonna use. This is birch. It just so happens this is what I have. I didn't pick it for any particular reason. I just, I just have it, and I'm just gonna use it. All right, I said I didn't choose birch for any particular reason, and that is true, but I will say of birch, that it's a good paint wood because the grain is non-porous. Um, it's like maple, and maple paint's really nice too. And poplar paint's really nice too, but you would not want to use something like oak or walnut or any really open poured grain wood for paint projects because you can paint it 10 times and you still see you know, the big open pores of the wood. So this is a good closed pour wood, really smooth, easy to paint. I like making these window frames in my shop instead of on the job site. It makes things easier because I have all the tools at my disposal. Also, I really enjoy making these window trims from a rough stock, meaning one inch thick lumber, all right? The reason I like it is because when I run everything through the jointer and the planer and straight edge it and everything, I end up with perfectly straight pieces of wood. I'm not picking through a pile of material that I ordered from the lumber yard that they're all crooked and bent and bowed and twisted and making complications for me that I that I don't need, you know what I'm saying? So I'm gonna do that with the door frames too in this house. I'm gonna make all my door jams and all the door trims because it's a lot easier to deal with when they're all perfectly straight, nice hardwood, it's gonna be beautiful. Now is one of my favorite times. We're gonna hand plane the edges of these boards. As you probably know, that's my favorite thing to do. I love to hand plane the edge of a board. We have a pile of wood here. It's all different lengths because we cut them all, you know, to certain lengths. So Brett is going to basically make a whole window bunch together of the right boards so that we don't cut the wrong boards for the wrong window and accidentally cut one too short or something. So basically we're just going to bunch them together in groups of windows and then we're just about going to make one. The last component to our window frame assembly here is this little batten strip looking piece. It's one inch by an inch and a half. And this is gonna serve as the sill or the sill extension perhaps. Apron will go under it and we're gonna pocket screw this all together. So we just thought that'd be a nice little detail to add because it sort of mimics the appearance of the outside window trim and uh, give it a little bit more detail. The carpenter's favorite tool in the shed. All right, let's get to it. Pocket screw it. Yeah, that hit home pretty good, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what you just said. <laughs> but yes, it went in nice and tight very well. So check out the vacuum here. I just added this drum liner here. This is like a giant plastic liner here. What that allows me to do is use the bags in the vacuum and the liner holds the bag into the drum. All right, so if there was not this big heavy plastic liner, the vacuum would actually suck a loose bag up into the machine. It would go whoop, and it would get probably wrapped up in the thing there. So it is, it is necessary and critical that you use one of these liners here if you're gonna bag straight into your drum. So why don't I do this on my normal jobs, you might ask? Well, so far I haven't found anybody that is willing to pay me what it really costs to do this in labor and in material because it's easily double the cost of just buying wood from the hardware store or wherever you get it. And it takes a lot more time to actually process that material into that straight board that I love so dearly. But hey, I can do it for myself and nobody's complaining. Hey, Dad. Yep, I knew it. Oh, All right, give it a go. Come on. Okay. See what you got. In the world. Oh, wow. Only a few minutes ago, it was a rough board. And look, we have a nice window. Well, and the rest of it, sawdust. It's gonna be a wrap for this morning. Brett's headed off to his real job. Yeah. So uh, we're gonna shut it down here. 
and we have a couple frames to show for our labors. Here we go. You know, one scary thing about doing this is we're putting a lot of time into these things and we're going to paint them and everything and then take them to the job. So, like, what I'm saying is I hope they're the right size. That's all. We're bringing in some of these window trims that we made back at the shop and we stand a good chance of getting them installed since that's actually all we have to do today. I want to give you a good look at the back of these window frames. They are simply put together with a couple pocket screws here. You know, it's a very easy way to do it on the bottom. You can see I have it all screwed together. Everything is nice and tight and it makes for a very strong unit here and very easy to build. I've planned for about a quarter of an inch reveal on the sides and top and flush on the bottom where this sill extension just kind of comes out from the bottom of the other sill. So I'm just eyeballing it and feeling with my hand to align it, start shooting. I got the honor of having Brett's dad right here. He's doing some fine work in here, filling these nail holes and sanding. Yeah, this is, this is just for relaxation. This is kind of like a, um, we need to play some uh, rain sound and, you know, heart surgeon. How about that? Amazing. I'm not used to working on stuff that isn't moving. Oh no. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Well, like you know, we say it's no big deal. <laughs> Let's take a second to thank our sponsor for today's video, Skillshare. If you don't know, Skillshare is an online learning community where millions of people come together to take the next steps in their creative journey. Skillshare offers thousands of classes for entrepreneurs like me, ranging from cooking to photography. Right now, I'm taking SketchUp classes, 3D furniture modeling with Bob Holworth. This course is about how to design and build furniture in SketchUp. Specifically, we'll be working with a shaker style end table. I'm using what I've learned to transition from only doing pencil drawings to now being able to 3D model anything that we can build. Skillshare is curated with learning in mind, so there are no ads and they're always adding new classes. Skillshare is very affordable, less than $10 a month with an annual membership. The first 1,000 people to use the link in our description will get a free trial of Skillshare premium membership. Be sure to check it out so that you can explore your own creativity. This is a great moment. We're gonna clear out an area in the kitchen where we can bring in the hardwood flooring that's now ready and it's ash, wood, random width, long lengths, and we're gonna set it here because we're gonna start the flooring on this long wall in the living room. Boop, 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 brrr, come on out to here. Boom, shoot down the hallway, do a flip strip, maybe a domino strip or dominoes, uh, back to back, boom, go that way to that wall. And then we're gonna finish up by heading this way into the kitchen. We're gonna try to use some scrappy or not as good material under the cabinets to preserve all the best quality material. And then we're gonna come across here all the way to the front door. We're gonna actually turn 90 degrees and run the flooring this way in this room because the framing runs the opposite direction. This is the only room in the house where the framing is running differently. So we always like to install our hardwood flooring running perpendicular to the floor joist system. That is at least what I think is the best practice. Well, here I am back at Homer King's woodworking shop. I'm here for a very special thing. I'm picking up my hardwood flooring. He's been milling this for me in his giant shop with his giant machines, and I'm very excited to see it. And I think right behind me, his dump truck there is full of all the uh, shavings, the planer shavings. But, uh, you have to make it past editing though. Yes. And I'm not in control of editing. Oh, well, good. So uh, <laughs> anyway. Who edits? Uh, Eric does. Uh, so Homer, Homer is gonna give me a demonstration of this awesome uh, edging machine. What What is it really called though? Straight line rip saw. A straight line rip saw and it's called that for a good reason. It puts a straight edge on a board.
this material here belongs to someone else, but it is undergoing the same process my material went through. First, it goes through this giant green planer here. This is a porter, and this is a three foot wide jointer that is automatically fed. It's called a facing planer. Next, they flip it around and send it through this thickness planer. They go through about two passes, and that gets it to look about like this. So it's not 100% smooth, but the last little bit of material will be removed by the, uh, the machine that puts the tongue and groove on it. After all the boards are made to be the same thickness, they run through this automatically fed straight line ripper, which uses a laser line to identify the uh, location of the cut and these giant feed belts here that draw the board in perfectly straight and maintain a straight feed consistently through the machine. That thing is pretty awesome. And what is left? Well, a pile of straight boards with straight edges and this pile of rip uh, material here. So, hey, this makes some great kindling right here. And these guys make it in massive quantities. Well, we'll get a little look at my material. Here's some of it. I'll get some shots outside so that we can really see it. But this is the bottom side that's grooved here. And these grooves kind of help with stability, give it a little bit of airflow and help prevent cupping and such. And there are other reasons that I don't know about, but somebody could probably tell me. The last machine that my material went through is this molder head cutter. I wanna say this is a six head machine. It takes material off of all four sides of the wood as it travels through here. This is a monster machine. I don't know how to say that, so I'm not even gonna try, but I can tell you that it is very big. It's massive. It's very old looking and it's extremely industrial, not for the home shop. Um, but what it does is it planes the top, the final thickness, it planes the bottom with the grooves in it and it puts a groove on one edge and a tongue on the other edge. And it actually makes a flat board become a piece of flooring. Yeah, and Tool Envy is a real thing, folks. Let's check out his jointer. He's got a power feed for it. This is a 16 inch wide jointer that appears to be about 10 feet long. That's pretty awesome. Now you can see that this stuff is long. It's like 12 feet long, a lot of it. And we did a random width. We used three inch, four inch, five inch, six inch, and seven inch wide boards. Why did I do that, you might ask? Because that's how you maximize the yield of the wood from its various widths that I obtained it in. So by doing that, we get the most amount of coverage out of this pile of wood. It is gonna be a little tricky getting this on here though. Let's see here. My trailer is not really made out for this so much here, so the fender's getting away. This is pretty nice to have some help here. We're getting all the wood moved in, trying to stack it in their respectable width for the uh, sake of being able to tell how much of each kind I have. Here comes Brett. Brett's in there. He just asked me how much can we realistically get done in a short amount of time today. And I said, I don't know. All I know is I'm going crazy as fast as I can and nail this stuff down. So it's been four hours. We started at eight, it is now 12, and we have all of the living, kitchen, dining area, starting into the entry hallway from the back, and some of this one bedroom because it all ran in here. So I need to make a reverse strip right here to, to change the direction of the way we're traveling and nailing the wood. So I'm actually gonna take a, enough wood home and I'm gonna mill a piece that has a double tongue. It'll lock into this, lay down, and get nailed back that way, allowing us to reverse. We put down quite a bit of material here. I know it's gonna be super tight as far as having enough material. So let me explain 
That's the reason why we omitted the flooring around here under the kitchen cabinets. We need to save as many boards as possible. We also left out this closet. We put a threshold piece so the closet could be done separately. We have a few other things we're gonna do related to that. There's gonna be a bench seat here about 18 inches out. So we're gonna skip that and save material because I really don't wanna run out. We have to do this whole bedroom still. We are gonna put a threshold in this closet doorway so that that area in the closet could be done separately in the, in the case that I don't have enough of this kind of wood. I wanna talk about this mallet really quickly. The rubber side is primarily for hitting the nailer, okay? The metal side is for hitting your boards in tight and it's tapered so that you don't hit the top edge of your wood, you hit the bottom edge where it won't be seen in the case that you put a dent in it, which you certainly will if you strike it with this heavy mallet. These really wide boards, the widest ones are eight inches wide. They would be quite, they would be quite prone to cupping and um, so what we're going to do is, is recommended for these to actually face nail them in the middle of the board, okay? And not just straight down because a, a nail straight up and down can squeak and be loose. So you actually fire one this way at an angle and the other way, we call that crossing it up. Down the length of the board, about every two feet, we'll shoot two nails. They'll be crossed up, crossed up all the way down. And that is going to hold the middle of the board from being able to lift up from the floor in between where it is nailed on this edge and on the back edge, it will be held in with the last board. Another thing here, these boards are not end matched. What that means is they don't have a tongue and groove that goes across the end of the board, like typical mass produced manufactured hardwood flooring. So that is another reason we're going to put face nails in the ends of the boards is to prevent the ends of the boards from, from one cupping and the other staying flat causing a little catch seriously i'm not throwing away anything even this cracked board right here i will cut some straight edges on that joker and nail it down in a closet i'm not even kidding like you think i'm kidding trust me i'm not that's that's for real right now so why did we cut this so close on material well the reason is I bought this material about five years ago, having no idea that it might be approximately the right amount to do this house. So it just so happened to look pretty close. So I had it milled and now we're gonna find out how far we can go with it. So that's, that's why. It's not like I can't add stuff or something. I wanna take a quick second to show this piece of wood that I modified here. I took it home and cut the groove side off. And so there's the tongue side, factory tongue side. And what I did is I duplicated it, except my edge is square. I just duplicated the tongue side so that I have a double tongued, tongued, double tongued board here. So I can go all the way across the room with a double tongue. That allows me to make what I call a reverse strip. So we ran this wood in here from the living room. And you can see right here, I've got the groove side, so I need the tongue to go in that and then stick out a tongue this way. So that'll be a nice little reverse strip. Next, I need to deal with this access hole. We left a giant access hole into the crawl space because we thought we would put the heating and air conditioning in here in the crawl, but we didn't. So we just need a manhole sized hole here. So I'm gonna box this opening down to something smaller and then make it like a cover that you can lift off to get access to the crawl space. There is no outside access to the crawl. Cut nails. We're gonna do something special. We are? Yep. We're gonna nail a bunch of cut nails into the wood flooring. What we got going on right now, we're checking up some drill bits. Let me see that thing. We are using a tapered drill bit. Tapered, right? Pre-drilling for the cut nails because they are actually tapered. Now the bit obviously is smaller we tried a bit that was not tapered, and that's what we got. Nice jag right there. So uh, go ahead there, bud. We're just going to run the bit in there um, so we don't split. I'd back up a little bit. That's a little, that's less than an inch right there. Should I go? Uh, go ahead and hit it. That's, that's closer than an inch. This is what we're going for here. Just nailing the ends of the boards. If we have extra nails, we'll go down the length of the boards. Bigger hammer there, bub? 